we never know what's going to come our way and what kind of effect it may have. I want to share with you an event that began six months ago, which may have seemed to be a random event, but the chain reaction ended up saving the lives of three families. A fascinating story. I want to share this with you because I was very moved by this story. My first name is Yisrael. I was actually named after the very first Hasidic rabbi, Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov. When I was born in 1961, it was just after his 200th death anniversary. So my parents chose to name me after him. So I developed a wonderful affinity towards him, towards his life, and I studied him. And uh, most of all, I wanted to emulate him. And what he taught me was unconditional love to everyone. And he also taught me that everything that happens in life happens for a purpose. And finally, to serve God with joy and happiness. He was one who introduced the concept of singing in prayer, dancing in prayer, and being of a happy spirit. And finally, his greatest lesson was to serve God out of love, not out of fear. This event touched me because it just happened just happened 46 days ago and the event is as follows six months ago this is in Israel the most religious neighborhood known in Israel next to Jerusalem is a neighborhood called Bnei Barak densely populated with super ultra orthodox Jewish people and then you have People who live in other cities, some on the border, such as the various kibbutz. A kibbutz is a communal city where people live together as a community. And, they, and this is very popular right after the Holocaust, where many came to Israel. They would set up these communal um, kibbutzniks, kibbutzim, which basically um, everything is communal. Everyone shares together and everyone eats together in the dining room. Everyone works together, shares each other's income with each other. It's a, it's a fascinating concept. It didn't last very long. Eventually, many of these kibbutzes closed down, but there are still some remnants that do exist. There's a place called a moshav, there's a place called a kibbutz. These are just different indications of these communal uh, communities. Um, generally, they're very secular, very distant from observance. So you would take the two polars of super religious from Bnei Brak and what's called a kibbutznik, someone from these villages, these communities, who are extremely ignorant to practicing Judaism, very secular, very non-observant, as they say, referred to in Hebrew as chiloni, someone who is non-observant, versus dati, someone who's religious, or in this case, B'nai Brak is super-religious, ultra-religious. So this is the background of this story that's happening that became very fluid that began six months ago so this very super ultra religious man is driving along the highway and he pulls over because he needs some gas he gets into the gas station and just routinely goes outside grabs the gas from the gas pump and begins pumping gas and he looks around and he sees a very non-religious man pacing very distraught. So this ultra-religious man reaches out to say, Habibi, my dear friends, everything okay? And he says, ah. He says, what do you mean? What happened? He says, you know, I ran out of gas. I barely made it to the gas station. And here I am. And I realized I left my credit card at home. 
So this religious man from Bnei Brak finishes pumping his gas. He says, come bring your car over. Let me fill you up. And he fills him up a whole tank of gas. So the kibbutznik looks at him and said, uh, you know, let me get your phone number and I'll send you the money for the full tank of gas. And the religious man says, no, 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 no. I don't want to take any money. I want to keep this mitzvah. I don't want to lose this good deed by taking money from you. Let, let it be my gift. Let it be my mitzvah. So I was able to help a fellow Israeli out. He looks at him and he says, wow, this hasn't happened to me before. You know, I come from a place called Kibbutz Be'eri. It's on the border with Gaza. The spirit in Kibbutz Be'eri is not very favorable towards the religious Jews. And I grew up being very condescending to religious Jews. As a matter of fact, on my bumper sticker, it says, stamp on the religious people. <laughs> it says, that's just the way I grew up. It says, meeting you and connecting with you, it's my first time I'm ever connecting with a religious Jew and seeing your, your benevolence, your kindness. He went to his car and he peeled off the bumper sticker and he gives him a hug. And he says, you know what, let's stay in touch. So this ultra-religious from Bnei Brak takes down the phone number of this kibbutznik from Beiri, and they bid each other farewell, and they part ways. This is six months ago. Friday comes, this religious man from Bnei Brak lifts up the phone and calls the kibbutznik and says, Shalom, how are you? This is your buddy we met at the gas station. I'm just calling to check in on you and wishing you a Shabbat Shalom, which means have a peaceful Sabbath. And the kibbutznik says, oh, you know, I never thought you'll call me. I thought we're from two different worlds. We both live in Israel. <laughs> I'm so unreligious. You're so religious. I didn't think there would be any chance of us connecting, but thank you for calling. This ultra-religious Haredi from Bnei Brak called every single Friday, calling to say Shabbat Shalom, to check in and you see how you're doing. This is six months. Let's talk about just before the high holidays, the end of the Hebrew year. He's chit-chatting with his new friend from the Kibbutz Be'eri. And this Kibbutznik says, you know, you've been wishing me Shabbat Shalom for six months already. I don't even know what it means. He says, yeah, I know what the words mean, have a peaceful Sabbath, but what, is, what does Shabbat mean? We don't do Shabbat in our kibbutz. I have, I've never done Shabbat. So could you just tell me what is Shabbat all about? This is where divine providence comes in. The ultra-Orthodox man tells him, you know, I cannot really explain what Shabbat is. It wouldn't be doing it justice. Why don't you come to our home? Bring your family to our home and we'll have Shabbat together. You'll see it, you'll experience it. And I guarantee you, you'll love it. It will be an experience like you never had before. Nothing that I could talk to you on the phone. You have to see it and live it. He says, ah, I don't think so. I've never done it. He says, think about it. Another week calls back and he says, you know, I spoke it over with my family and we said, yeah, why not? Let's check this out. We've heard so much about Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom, but what does it actually mean? So the gentleman from Bnei Brak looks on the calendar and he says, well, you know, New Year's is starting soon. New Year's, you spend hours in the synagogue. He says the first introduction for Shabbat experience is not really going to work out. Yom Kippur, we didn't eat. So he said, you know what, why don't you come for Simchat Torah? It's the end of the high holiday season, and it's a very joyous day. It's where everyone dances with the Torah. And why don't you spend Simchat Torah with us and bring your family with us? And they both looked at the calendar, and the date was October 7. And he says, yeah, I'm in. Count me in. I'll come with my family. 
This Bray Brock ultra orthodox guy is so excited that he's going to have a family from Kibbutz Be'eri who's never had the Shabbat experience in his life going to come and spend Shabbat in his home with Simchat Torah. A few days go by, this gentleman from Bnei Brak gets a phone call. His father, who lives in a city called Sederot, which is also on the border with Gaza. And his father says, son, you know, in a few days, Simchat Torah is going to be. I, I would like you to come. Come with your family and celebrate the joy of Torah with us. And the son tells his father, you know, I'd love to, but I already committed. I actually invited a secular Jew from Kibbutz Be'eri to come and spend some Torah with us. He says, from Kibbutz Be'eri? Because it has its reputation being a very secular kibbutz. He says, yeah, I made my commitment and I cannot break it. He says, but I am your father. I, I, I want you to honor me. The Ten Commandments says, honor your parents. Come and spend some Torah with me in Sederot. He says, Papa, I don't know what to do. Let me get back to you. He calls up his rabbi, his mentor. He says, you know, I got a dilemma. The fifth commandment is you must honor your parents. But I already committed to this non-religious Jew who has never, ever had Shabbat that he's going to come from Kibbutz Be'eri on October 7th, Simchat Torah, to be with me. What do I do? Do I do the fifth commandment honoring my parents? Or do I stay home and host the guests from Be'eri? And the rabbi listened to him and said, my opinion is that your father should come to you. And if you want, I will call your father. Because it's most important that this Jew who has never had Shabbat before should have that experience. He called back his father and he said, I spoke to my rabbi, my mentor, who said, that I should invite you, you should come to us. And that is what happened. His father came to Simchat Torah. This gentleman who we met by sheer chance, divine providence at the gas pump from Kibbutz Be'eri, came with his family. This was October 7. We all know the rest of the story. October 7 was the massacre where almost everyone at Kibbutz Beiri was slaughtered, massacred. Sederot was the first impact where many, many died and many homes were burnt. Because of this act of kindness at the gas pump, three families were saved. The ultra-Orthodox did not go to Sederot to be with his father, which he may have perished. The gentleman and his family from Kibbutz Be'eri left the Kibbutz, came to Bnei Brak to have a Shabbat experience. Three families were saved because of an act of kindness. We may even call it the, a random act of kindness. Because when he woke up in that morning, both of them woke up, they had no intentions of knowing each other. And because he took the initiative to reach out, he saw a distraught fellow person. He didn't ignore it. He didn't, wasn't oblivious. He made it happen. He took the initiative and said, you look distraught. What's going on? How can I help you? Imagine. Imagine if he would have been preoccupied in his own life and ignored his situational awareness of what's happening around him and would have ignored that gentleman. Chances are the gentleman and his family would have been at Kibbutz Beiri at the massacre. This is what divine providence is all about. This story illustrates that when we 
have an opportunity. When opportunity comes to us, we must jump on the opportunity. When you see someone distraught, we need to do something about it. Don't mind your own business. Minding your own business is not Jewish. Minding your own business is not Torah life. But minding everyone's business is what Judaism is about. When you see someone distraught, it is your responsibility, even a total stranger, to say, what is happening? We look back in the Bible, the same story happened. A beautiful story when Joseph, when Joseph was imprisoned and he saw one of his fellow prisoners distraught, he asked him the same question. Why are you distraught? He didn't mind his own business. The whole chain of events that happened after that, that gentleman was a minister of the Pharaoh. When he was released from prison, he told Pharaoh about Joseph. Then eventually Joseph was freed from prison. Then Joseph became the viceroy over Egypt. Then Joseph was able to provide provisions for the 12 tribes so that they could survive through a famine, that eventually they were able to begin the Jewish nation. And it all started from one mention and notice of a fellow person that you reached out and you touched them and you said something. And that is the story that I have learned from this horrific, terrible horror that's happening in Israel. There are some sprinkles of light that have risen from these ashes, and these are one of them. For us to learn from these lessons and to act upon them. When you hear a story like this, there's a reason why it came to you, so that you too should be the one to take action, take the initiative. When you see someone distraught, lift their spirits up, show concern. You never know what the end result was going to be. This episode started six months ago and it went to October 7, where these three families are living now because of that act of goodness and kindness. And we know that when the Messiah will arrive, he will arrive because we have all done random acts of kindness. CNN once approached my rabbi, Rabbi Schneerson, at his synagogue in Brooklyn, New York. And he asked him, what is your message to the world? When is the Messiah going to come? And he looked into the camera and he said, when the world does acts of goodness and kindness, that's going to bring the Messiah. The Messiah is ready to come now. It is only from our part to do something additional in the realm of goodness and kindness. So now you have heard a real story that just happened some 47 days ago on October 7, 2023. In real time, think about your goodness and kindness, how many lives it can't save. God bless you. God loves you. May God protect our brothers and sisters in Israel as they are fighting to save Israel, that they should come back safe and well. And may God bring home all of our hostages speedily in our days. Amen.